Okay, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst. And some of the stuff you've been reiterating over and over again so that we so we get it. I pray this morning once again, what we hear, what we look at, would not just go and move into our heads and just stop there. But I pray it would go deep into our spirits. It will go deep into our hearts. Where your word would cut through. Cut through, Lord. We don't want it to wear your word like a cap, which can fly off the moment when we leave this place. But we want something to be deposited in our hearts. Because your word has power. Your word has the power to transform and change lives. Your word has power to create. And therefore, Lord, I pray your word would bring that creative work in us today and transform us, Lord. So we can be the people you're calling us to be, to rise up in our nation at this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last Sunday... We had the teens go, the young adults, I believe, had a good meeting. Excited for what God is doing. But I want to um, quickly give you a recap of what we started last week because I believe uh, it is something very serious that God wants to do, right? So as I told you last Sunday, I'm telling you again, fasten your seatbelts. Fasten your seatbelts. Because this is, I believe, quite a challenging uh, message, something challenging that God wants us to do. So let me dive in. Um, right. We are continuing on, we need a move. Amen? God is saying we need to move. And I'm so encouraged by so many people I've heard speak to me over the last two, three months when we began, we need to move. Saying, I don't know, inside we're just sensing God is saying to move. And that is just confirmation. I can tell you as, as a pastor, it is one of the most uh, encouraging things is to hear from your congregation saying, God is telling me the same thing. Right? God is telling me the same thing that He wants us to move. He wants me to move. He wants me to start doing something. And that is so exciting because several of you have come and said that. Right? Several of you are sensing this and that's exciting. In fact, last week you were showing me uh, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 uh, talks about dry bones and, and in this, please understand this, in this, in, in, in this what God is saying is, you need my people, you need to move. Why is that? Because the dead don't move. The dead don't move. And God is saying my church has been dead for too long. My people have been dead for too long. Spiritually dead is what I'm talking about. And therefore the dead don't move. But instead, he, he was showing me from Ezekiel 37, uh, just 1 to 14, where, where, he, where this is a picture of Israel. And he calls the prophet Ezekiel, and, and he says, Ezekiel, in the, the Lord shows him a valley of dry bones. And the Lord says, Ezekiel, look, a valley of dry bones. This is the house of Israel. This is the nation of Israel. They said their hope is gone. They are lost and they feel hopeless. And lost and hopelessness brings death, brings spiritual death. And here was an entire nation that was a valley of dry, dead bones. But then God chooses one man. He says, Ezekiel, what do you think? Ezekiel was a little like us, uh, like me, diplomatic. Lord, only you know. So what do you think, Ezekiel? Uh, Lord, only you know, no? He says, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to prophesy. He says, prophesy over these dry bones. And he speaks, dry bones, live again. And then God sends a wind from the four corners. A wind comes and suddenly these skeletons start getting muscles and tissue and skin. And there suddenly rose a huge army. There rose an army and the Lord said, this is what I am doing. This is what I'm doing with my people. This is what I'm doing with my church. I'm bringing them out of death to life so they can be out there shining for me. Right? But that is not the sermon. The sermon we started last week was on Lazarus. Where the Lord showed me Lazarus. And in that whole Lazarus story, we were not looking at Jesus so much, but as, a, as Lazarus. Right? So I want to recap quickly. 
since many of you are not there. It, basically, listen, basically in the story of Lazarus, we picked it up um, at the tomb. Right? Like I said, the dead don't move. Right? We looked at the tomb where Jesus comes to the tomb. Jesus calls him out. He comes out of the tomb. He first tells people to roll away the stone. Lazarus comes forth. He gets Lazarus to change his clothes. He says, you, know, you can't live with dead clothes. And he says, take away those dead clothes. Right? And, and what the Lord is, was showing me is he's calling us out. He's calling us as an entire church to remove dead clothes. Because with dead clothes on, you cannot do the things God is calling you to do. You will not move at His pace. You will not move doing the things He wants. With your dead clothes on, we will do things the way we want. And very often it is to help with everybody else. It's all about, okay, where am I? What do I need? What do I need to do? How do I get out of this? And God says, that's not how you impact a nation. That's not how you move in me. That's not how you move. Right? So last week I, 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 I spoke about, uh, firstly, is that you can love Jesus. Anybody loves Jesus this morning? Okay, you love Jesus. Okay, love Jesus. She said, yeah, like she, she believes it. How many of you believe Jesus loves you? It will be really good. If you don't, be honest, if you don't know that, just tell him, Lord, show me that you love me. They're talking about your love. Show me. Honestly, the speaking to him is the best. Just ask him. And in this story, it is very clear Jesus loved Lazarus. Why? Because the scripture says so. Right. What does he say? Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom... It's, it's interesting. No? She didn't say, Lazarus, Lazarus, who loves you? Isn't that interesting? He didn't say, come on, your friend that really loves you is sick, come. No, but she says, you know what? The guy that you really love? So I, can I tell you, when, when the love of Jesus is on somebody's life, people can see. Because she said, Lazarus, because we know you love him. We know. It's not that Lazarus loved him, but there was a problem. Jesus can love you, you can love Jesus, but you can be very sick in your soul. Yes? I believe all of us, or at least most of us who are here, who knows that Jesus loves us, many of us are in our little way trying to love Jesus. But despite that, the soul is very sick. And I feel the Lord saying this sickness will, leave, will be unlike Lazarus, where he said it's not unto that. I believe this sickness will kill us spiritually because Lazarus actually died. Lazarus died. The one that Jesus loves, the one Jesus loves, and the one that loves Jesus died because he was sick. And the Lord was saying, guys, we need to deal with some things here. Right? We need to deal. Then the second thing we saw was Jesus makes his way to the tomb and then Jesus calls out by name. And I want us to understand right now Jesus is calling us to get out of our tomb. See, Lazarus, when Jesus came to the tomb, Lazarus was dead for four days. He was wrapped up with grave clothes. He was lying dead inside a cave with a big rock that was in front of the entrance. But when Jesus comes, he stands there and he says, Lazarus! For all those who were sleeping. <laughs> you don't know what to expect from me, do you? Come out. Come out. Lazarus, come out. It's interesting. He didn't say, all you dead people, come out. But he called him by name. And for me, that's special. I believe right now, right this morning, God is calling you and I by name. Do you hear him calling you? See, we need to be listening this morning. And he's saying, God calling my name. Your earthly father is calling your name. It's important for us to understand. And then we looked at a few other things where, where uh, when he says, come out, it's interesting how Lazarus, you see, if that, that you and I need help to come out. Please understand this. You and I need help to come out. Because if Lazarus didn't have help from his family and friends, he would have come out like this. And what happens? He comes to the entrance and, doom, knocks his head 
on the stone. Because if the stone had not been removed, in his grave clothes, he'd have come and boom, knocked his head. And he'd have probably died again. <laughs> there's something to be born again, but there's something to be dying again. Because he comes, chick, 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 doom. But the interesting thing is, after Jesus says, before he shouts, come out, he tells his friends and family, move the stone. Move the stone. Move the obstacles. Move the stone. I hope you're catching something, what I'm trying to tell you. See, that's why we need community. That's why we're talking about small groups. God has called you to be in a group that those people will come and they'll try to help you move. They will move the rock so you can walk out. And the second thing is, he tells them, take his clothes off. Take those dead clothes off him. Isn't that interesting? It was the people around him who helped remove his dead cloth. So I believe this is such an important truth. Why? Because we love to do everything solo. And God is saying, no, I created you for relationship. God is relationship. You and I are created for relationship. Whether you like people or not, you are created for relationship. But I hate everybody. doesn't matter. You are created for relationship. Amen. Please get that into your head because many of us want to stay solo. We want to cut the whole world out. We want to be all by ourselves. You will die because your soul is created for relationship. Maybe you need to pick some good friends. That's a different story. right? But that's, that's so important. But I also want to tell you, as much as Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out, I believe Lazarus still had the choice whether to come out or not. So you have a choice. You want to come out? Or if Lazarus would say, Are you a wise Jesus? Are you happily dead and waiting? Are you... I didn't have to do anything because when you're dead, you don't have to do anything. Deep, long nap. I know some people who love their naps, but just better wake up. See, this morning, I want to continue from that because I believe the Lord is saying, Listen, listen, young people, old people, all people, change your wardrobe, change your clothes. Because dead clothes smell. Dead clothes stink. And no matter how much, see, you and I are so used to putting on these dead cloths and then per, per, pouring perfume. Psh, 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 psh. And you come and you're with people and everyone say, hey, you smell good. Nobody knows how you're dead inside. Nobody knows how sick the soul is because we pour expensive perfume on ourselves. It's only a matter of time before the smell of the perfume runs out. You know, I believe God is doing a house cleaning around the world. I've told you this before. He's cleaning house around the world. Top, top leaders from, from Christian leaders are falling like flies because God is calling the church out and saying, no, you can't hide the abuse you've been doing or this you've been doing or that you've been doing. I have waited long enough. If you don't get your act right, I'm coming. I'm going to expose you because I love you and I want you to repent and be healed. Because if I leave you like this, you will be blinded to your sin. You won't do anything about your sin. So I need to expose you. Please catch that. The reason why these leaders are being called and they're falling is because God loves them. And if God doesn't catch them, he's given them time to change. And because they're not changing, he loves them too much to keep them on their own. Because they will never change unless he calls them out. Scary. So, it's time to change wardrobes. Let me show one picture. This is kind of what we have. I believe this is, this is somewhat like the insides wrapped up with dead cloth. This is not very attractive unless it's Halloween. See, Jesus says, listen to what Jesus is saying. Jesus said, take those clothes out. Guys, take that clothes out. And then we began by saying, we are on the move. What did Jesus tell his disciples in Acts chapter 1? You will receive power. I am going to robe you with power, with the Holy Spirit. I am going to robe you. I am going to give you new robes. Right? So can we see the other picture? Not this one. What if you think this is something in the spiritual realm? He's robing you with power and there's an aura about you. That in the spiritual realm, because when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, my clothes don't change. But in the spirit realm, in the spiritual realm, when the Holy Spirit comes up, your clothes may be still the same. 
But in the spiritual realm, you are glowing with power. You are glowing. So you and I have a choice to look like this or the one before. Jesus offers you and says, get out of that and come to the other. But that's a choice. That's a choice. You and I need to choose. But he wants us to choose. Why? I believe there is such a revival coming to our nation. I'm telling you. We've spoken about this. God is on the verge of a move. God will use different and different kind of people. But there's something God is doing. And that doing thing is going to happen through his people. That's why I said it's not political powers. He will use men and women in different positions as his tools to get his job done. But he's looking for partnership with the church. You and I. The church. And saying, you are the ones we are going to change this world with you and you and you and you and you and you and you. And he's saying, change. I'm calling you. Revival is coming. I really believe. But please hear me. Until you and I remove those clothes, we will never move in his revival. Sometimes these clothes have become fused. They've got fused. So you don't even know where to begin to remove. You don't know where to begin to remove. And God is saying, no, we have to change. You know, I was reading on, on two revivals. One is the Scottish revival. In Scotland, in the 1500s, there was a great revival in Scotland. It was triggered by a man named John Knox. John Knox. I love this man. You know what his prayer was before God? One man, huh? one man for a nation. He went before God and he said, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. Come on. You think he was wearing these clothes? Because people in these clothes can't pray those prayers. Their prayers are, Lord, don't let me die. He was praying, give me Scotland or I'm going to die praying for it. Because these were not the clothes he was wearing. As long as we have these clothes, it will be, give me Lord, give me Lord, give me Lord. No one is praying for Sri Lanka like that. Once in a way we'll throw up your Lord, bless this nation. Huh? Do something huh, in this election, Lord. Okay. You, eh? you, you understand the difference. These clothes will prevent us from hearing God and being moved by God in the things of God. When God is saying change. And that's how he believed one man with God is always a majority. Maybe you've heard that before. But it was something that this man said. One man with God is always a majority. A second revival was the Welsh revival. Right? 500 years later, or 400 years later, there was another man in Wales. Right? A man called Evan Roberts. He triggered a revival. That, you know, hundreds and thousands of people got saved in one year, and in the next year, this revival didn't stay in a nation, it went around the world. It went around the world. And this is so important. This is so important. He prayed so hard that the people of Wales uh, would, would, that something would change. In fact, it started with a youth service. It started with a youth service where he came and he had a service for young people and the Holy Spirit came upon the, Holy, the young people. And there was a transformation. And this is why I'm passionate about this revival. And I'm passionate to see young people enter in that revival. Because God is doing something. Because God is doing something. Right? There was conviction of the Holy Spirit that broke out. It said crime dropped so much. Listen to this guys. Crime dropped so much that certain police stations had no work. So the police formed a choir. To sing at services. They're like, we have no work to do. It's something that I can see people in this church doing. We form a choir. Right? See, what I'm trying to say, see, he had no theological background. He was a miner. He began as a miner and then he was a blacksmith. He knew nothing about the Bible. But God used him because he had a heart for the nation. Would you like to ask God for a heart for the nation? Because this nation needs people like those guys. Give me Sri Lanka. Oh, I will die, Lord. I'm going to pray. 
But beloved church and Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, until those clothes are taken off, you and I will never pray prayers like this. God is saying, take out those clothes. Time for a wardrobe change. See, anybody here likes to see revival? You want to see revival in Sri Lanka? You want to be a part of revival? Five people. Okay, let's meet after service. I think the rest of you can go home now. <laughs> no. Kidding, I'm kidding. But my question is, are you willing to do what revival requires? What is that? What does revival, what triggers revival? Prayer, yes. And then what does prayer trigger? Repentance. Until there is repentance, there is no revival. There has to be repentance. You and I need to come and say, Lord, take this filthy clothes, enough of the perfume. I've done the whole perfume thing for too long. I want you to strip out these clothes. Can I tell you, some of us will need help to take those clothes out. But if you don't get help, you will die. You will end up in that tomb. In fact, you know, as men, many of us don't like to deal with stuff. We don't like. Because we're very private. You ladies are more, more, more relational and, and you, you tend to connect. But sometimes we are just so proud and arrogant. And we are so worried if other people see our weaknesses. We don't. But can I tell you what the scripture says? James chapter 5 says, Therefore, confess your sin one to another. No, 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 I'll confess to you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, but James, the book of James, it's in the Bible. It says, confess your sin one to another and pray that you may be healed. There is a time of coming together, coming with Father. You don't have to go and share your sins with the whole world, but you need to catch some people when you are struggling and not breaking free and say, Lord, I need, I need help. Bro, I need help. Ladies, same story for you. Our problem today is too many people will not share because of gossip. People are scared. I, you, I remember some of you are here from other churches and you say, I was in that church. I shared something to the pastor's wife. It went like wildfire. Who? Oh, pastor's wife. Yeah, yeah, pastor's wife. See, that's how bad it is. That's how bad it is. And in fact, the Bible says, gossips and slanderers will not enter the kingdom of heaven, by the way. So you can have a title of pastor's wife or even pastor. You can have the title of pastor, but you are not going to the king, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God into the kingdom of heaven if you are a gossip and a slanderer. You won't. You can keep your title on earth, but you're not going to heaven. I didn't say that the Bible says that. But here I believe there is a time here. God is saying, repent. My people, I'm calling you to move, but I want you to remove, strip yourself of all these unnecessary clothes that you have put on yourself. They smell. They smell. See, I was sharing the other day here, uh, a few Sundays ago, you remember, not last Sunday, Sunday before last, the Holy Spirit was moving, we were praying for people, and, and it began with the Lord coming strong on holiness. I was sharing with Nathan the other day, because he was saying that our holiness is a bad word. Nobody likes these holy, holy ones. But I was thinking about it. Do you know, if holiness is bad, then God is bad. Think about that. If holiness is bad, then God is bad. Is God bad? No, the Bible says God is good. Then therefore holiness can't be bad. And why do we think holiness is bad? Because human beings... Human beings try to bring on their holiness on others. It's called religiosity. Please listen to this. Because if you think holiness is bad, you'll never pursue holiness. But God says, be holy as I am holy. So holiness is not bad if holiness is God. Amen? Amen. So the question is, Lord, how can I ever be holy? Because I say so, says the Lord. You can be because I said you can be holy. 
Yeah, but I know I come to a church and they say this, that and the other. He said, no, no, no. Our problem is we don't see holiness to the eyes of God. We have seen holiness to the eyes of religious men and women who say, oh, I am better than you because of my behavior. That's not holiness. That's not holiness. A few things that the Lord was showing me, man, I was just so excited. I was so excited. You know, during Jesus' time, they were the same guys. They were called Pharisees. They would come and tell the people, listen, you have to obey this law and this and this and this. You have to do this and 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 do this. And that's for the Pharisees. And then people would walk with, you know, religion like, so heavy. And that's why Jesus said, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. He was talking about this religious heaviness. And young people, you think you're radical? You think you guys are radical? You haven't seen nothing until you see Jesus. Because he did everything to tick them off. He knew the law said, no, no work on, 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 on Sabbath. Don't you move on Sabbath. Don't you work. You can only work from, walk from your home to the temple and back. They told you how far you can walk even on the Sabbath. Can you believe it? They gave it distance. They said you can di- walk so many, so that this distance only on the Sabbath. Anything else is work. What did Jesus do? He started healing people. He started healing people. And he started healing people on the Sabbath. And so they all got together. They came up to him and they tried to kill him. They tried to jail him by saying, How dare you? You're talking to the Son of God. You're talking to God. So blinded, full of religion, but can't see God. So they come to him, how dare you? We, you know, you, we, you, you, we, we're going to jail you because you're working on the Sabbath. What was Jesus' response to working on the Sabbath? He says, you religious guys, you have no clue of God's heart, do you? He says, the Sabbath was made for men. Man was not made for the Sabbath. He says, don't you get it? Sabbath is there to help people. People are not there to keep your Sabbath laws. They are there. Sabbath is there to help the people. I, I don't know if you're catching this. And what the Lord was showing me as I was preparing this, He said, our holiness is not to impress God. Holiness is to help people. Catch that. He said, your holiness is not to impress me. When God says, be holy as I am holy, it is not to impress him. And see, Lord, look at me. Look, my nails are cut. Is that in the, is that in the word? Did I need to cut my nails? Look at my hair, nice and short. Are, are you impressed? Am I holy? I'm, I, I won't eat pork. I won't eat this. I won't that. I, are you happy now? Am I holy? What, what is that? But that is how we think. Lord, look, I didn't wear shorts. I didn't wear shorts to shirt. I wore longs. I actually wore shoes and socks. I didn't come in slippers. Do I look holy for you now, Lord? <laughs> I feel Lord is laughing. He said, you guys, don't you get it? Your holiness, the holiness I've asked you to have here on this earth so that you can be a blessing to others like Jesus was. Your holiness will bless others. Catch this. Please catch this. I just caught it. And that just is moving my heart. Like, wow. Oh, really? Yeah. Our problem is we're measuring holiness through man's eyes. People of God, look at holiness through God's eyes. You think God doesn't know this side of heaven? None of us will be perfect, right? And yet he says, be holy. I'm like, Lord, you know where we're living, right? Uh, You yourself said the God of this age is, is the one in control, right? So then... So then, so then, how can I be holy? Oh, you can. You can. He says, holiness, you can. You can be holy. Just do what I've told you. Obey my word and you will be holy. Do what I have told you to do. You are holy. Your holiness doesn't come by the way you dress or this or that or the other. Your holiness, I'm looking at your heart because when you act as I am acting, as I am, You will be a blessing to others as well. Your holiness will bless others. So, older generation, all of you who were brought up in churches that said, unless you wear a dress that is here, again, I'm not not for dresses here because I I believe what I tell people, ladies, go for it, but don't be a distraction. 
Don't ever come to church wanting to be the attraction of all the men. Don't do that. Don't dress like that. So I will never tell you how to dress. But I will only tell you, have a mindset that when you are dressing, am I dressing so all the men are going to look at me or am I just going to dress because I want to honor you today? I want to look good for you, Lord. You see, think. Think as to why we do what. What is God's holiness? Right? You think God is going to default you by the inches that you have, by the number of inches? No. He's not. He's looking at your heart even when you dress. So dress like that. Dress like that. I will not, as a pastor of this church, tell you what the Bible doesn't say. I will not try to control you. With my standards, I not even control you and your children. I have certain standards for my family. Some of it may not be, be biblical even, but those are my standards. Right? And I'm not going to impose that on you. I will share certain things with you. You decide. Because all I've seen is my God has given me a choice on everything he's written in his book. I have a choice. And Jesus walked in this earth and said, healthy, unhealthy, boys, choose healthy. This is good for you. This Lot of tears, lot of pain. But that is free will to choose. Choose, but please church, let's choose wisely. There is a holiness he's calling us to. There is a holiness, come on, as adults, if you are an adult, you are a parent, God is saying, I want you to be holy so your children can see what holiness looks like. See, as parents, we are constantly telling our children what they should do and shouldn't do, but we are not an example. It's like the fathers who, who would slap and hit their children if they smoke or drank. But when they are there at every family party, they're smoking and drinking. But they're telling the child, don't you dare. You see what will happen to you. It's like, <laughs> joke. It's a joke. God wants us to be authentic. God wants us to be authentic. Our fakeness is because you can't have dead clothes. And try to be authentic. The dead clothes doesn't, you know, perfume is not good enough. The clothes have to change. We have to strip ourselves of those dead clothes and put on the power of the Holy Spirit that transforms and transforms lives. That has to change. See, you have a choice. Change your wardrobe, guys. Change the wardrobe. Go before God and say, Lord, strip me. I don't want to be that with perfume. Because I believe that's what the church looks more like. That with perfume. Of course we have perfume. Where he says, no. Let me fill you with power. And you will glow. And the demons would see the glow on your life. And when you enter places, demons will flee. When you enter, people will get hope. Just because you turned up. Because you are dressed up with my spirit. Come on. Change. Change the way we think. God is looking for authentic. God is looking for authentic. Your change, your transformation will impact. Young people, can I tell you, I impacted my father more than anybody else. I got beaten up by my father more than anybody else growing up. But I remember my father was not a believer. But you know something that I heard from my mother? My mother would tell them, mm, I don't know, but you know, all I know is Dinesh has changed a lot now after going to that church. <laughs> he was just party, party, party. Now he's not like, now he's going with that pastor and praying for people and doing this and that. You think I did that to impress him? I didn't. I was just doing what God was doing in my life, but my life spoke to my father. Same thing with my mother. As long as my mother was trying to tell him where he needs to get off and what he needs to be doing and this and that. He didn't change. But it was in her humility. When she chose humility, obedience to God. After years of clashing and clashing and uh, of, of wills and opinions and all that, it was a shift when God changed her heart. She changed and he changed. So can I tell you, our lives matter. Our transformation matters. You want to be a light? All our words mean nothing if there is no proof of that word working. Amen. Full of talk. God wants to change our wardrobes. I believe this morning, I'm going into three areas. Firstly, I believe God wants to heal marriages. 
We need to take off those robes. Especially when it comes to marriages. Too many of us are wearing robes like this and our marriages are just struggling. Our marriages are dying because this kind of clothes suffocate. I mean, come on, if you could actually breathe, if you were a living being, um, please understand, if you were a living being and you had your nose covered, you can't breathe, you suffocate. Right? That is, that, those clothes are good for whom? The dead, not for the living. Those clothes are good for the dead, but if you are living, then you can't have those clothes. You need to say, Lord, I need, God is saying, my people, remove that. I need to show this nation what a marriage looks like and have chosen you. Um, go to the other church, Lord. That, that one down the road. Better examples. Is that what we're going to say? Can I tell you? God loves people. God loves people. Even the ones, by the way, God doesn't like divorce. The scriptures say God hates divorce, but He loves people. Right? The thing is, unfortunately for for those who left, somehow we didn't condemn people here. We realize you, any relationship runs into issues and if not held, dealt healthily, it will break. This is why you need to be discipled. This is why you need to be part of a small group. This is why you need to grow. But I thank God for the number of lives that have been changed and transformed. You see, that whether you've been divorced, and some of you were divorced, some of you are married again. But I'm telling you, let this marriage show the world who Jesus is in your life. Don't just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. We can't do that. We can't do that. And I believe this morning God is saying, listen, I want to heal marriages. God wants to heal marriages. Some of you are standing there and saying, I don't know, Pastor, the, the, the fire has gone then you need the fire of the Holy Spirit back. You need the fire. We need the fire. Because this, you can't live like this. This is, not, this is not God's kingdom. There's something wrong. God takes broken, insecure people and He shows the world what He can do. That's what God does. And I believe here, He's here this, this morning and He wants to bring healing to marriages. At the same time, he wants us to repent of our work in the marriage as spouses. Men, our lack of love for our wives, right? That's not going to do, that's not going to cut it with God no matter all the hard work we do for the kingdom. God gives us a very simple, in Ephesians, you know, God says a very simple thing, Husbands, love your wives! I don't think he shouted it out, but I am, I am. Because sometimes that gets in. The loudness sometimes speaks to men louder. The louder you are, the louder. Because if I say, husband, love your wives. No, I don't think anybody, what did he say? <laughs> but I'm serious today. I'm serious this morning. This is what God is saying. If you, have lo- you have failed to love your wives the way I have told you to love your wives. Take the dead clothes off. Because those clothes will prevent you from loving your wife the way God wants you to love your wife. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Ooh, that's hard. But we can do it if we are robed with the Holy Spirit. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. That's what God is saying. Husbands change. You see, I've told you this before. When I stand before God on judgment day, more than telling Him what I did with you and this church, because I believe the church is His. It's not mine. This church is his. But the wife, he gave me. And the children, he gave me. I have to stand and when he says, Dinesh, church, of course, they were much, we could have done a much better job, but at the end of the day, my church. What did you do with the wife and children I gave you? Sorry? What did you do with the wife and children I gave you? I have to give an account. By the way, not just me, all of us. You have to give an account to God what you did with the wife and the children he gave you. If you're, a, if you're a believer, if you're not a believer, he won't ask you that question. If you didn't know, he won't ask you this question. But today I told you. So you're in trouble. He will ask you the question. Wives, 
Wives are did he say? The submissive, in other words, what is all this thing? Honor, honor. Wives, respect your husbands. There are too many murmuring and complaining and complaining and murmuring about your husband. Stop it. He is not going to change with your complaints. He won't. I, I, I'm telling you, your husband will never change if you continue complaining and complaining. He won't. Respect him and see what he'll do. Show him respect. That's what he says. This is wives, respect your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. See, there aren't ten commandments for wives and ten commandments for the, for, for the husbands. Some of you are saying, Pastor, we are not married. But some of you are going to get married soon. You better know, know what God says now. Because how you treat another woman, whether you are married or not, you have to give an account to God. How we treat one another. I'm not married so I can treat my wife, this woman that I'm with like crap. No, you can't. But we're not married. It doesn't matter. How you treat people. Can I tell you, we need to repent. Let's say, Lord, take these stinky clothes off us. We want you to remove it. Well, Ephesians 5.30 So again I say to you, man must love his wife as he loves himself and wives must respect her husband. It's not rocket science. Please try this and see how it works. Try it and see how it works. The more I love her, which I do in small doses sometimes because I'm so busy and occupied with myself and I don't, because I'm going to repent today, I hope some of you will join me in doing so. The more I love her, the more she honors and respects me. I'm telling you, that's a fact. And the more she honors and respects me, oh, my love for her just grows. But if she's saying, constantly telling me all the wrongs I'm doing or the things I'm not doing, somehow love goes, where did the love go? It was there some time ago. It goes. It does. Are you hearing? Are you hearing me? You're not hearing me. Are you hearing what the Holy Spirit is telling you this morning? Not just me. I'm just a voice this morning. So this is what we're going to do. Can you come up here, please, wife of my youth? <laughs> Thank you. But all of you who are married and you want to repent and get your marriage right, would you stand up with your wife, with your spouse, if she's here or he's here? If you're here with your wife and you say, Lord, we want to make our marriage better. Lord, I want to repent today. I don't need a, a sword to my heart. There's already conviction that I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing my job right. And if you're a spouse that says, yeah, I know. Okay, he has so many faults, but... Mm, Maybe I also can do a little changes. Then would you ask the Lord right now? Let's go before God. Husbands, you ask the Lord for you. Wives, you ask for you and say, Lord, change my heart. Forgive me. Let's come to Him with repentance. Lord, forgive us where we have failed. Father, I pray for the husbands here. And say, Lord, forgive us where we have failed. We have failed, Lord. We're not here to, because our righteousness is like filthy rags, you said. So I'm not going to stand here with my righteousness and my little list of what I have done. But I'm here with the conviction of the Holy Spirit and says, Lord, I have not loved her the way you've asked me to love her. So I, I repent this morning. Forgive me. Would you pour out your love into my heart so I can love her better? Would you pour out your love into my heart so I can be a more secure man? And in that security, I can love her better. And Father, this morning, I pray for spouses, for wives. Lord, I pray for the wives. And I pray, Lord, give them the ability to trust you. That when they respect, or as your word says, submit, it is not for any other reason, but because they trust you. Because you said, wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. That they would choose as Jesus, as the scripture says, Jesus 
was an example to us who did not retaliate. He did not retaliate. But he humbled himself. And therefore we know God so highly exalted him and gave him the name above every other name. Lord, I pray for every single wife that is struggling this morning. Father, I pray, let faith arise to trust you even if they don't trust their husbands. Let them trust you because you are faithful and you will see them through. And therefore, pour your love right now this morning into their hearts. Restore our marriages, Lord. Restore. I pray for anyone here in their hearts and minds, they are so tired and fed up of their marriage that they are deciding in their heads and hearts how to end their marriage. Father, I speak healing in Jesus' name. I speak healing that comes from you, that can only come from you. I pray this morning, as we heard earlier on, Lord, as a soothing balm, where the cracks are, as you told Surin, where the cracks are, Lord, that you are pouring a healing balm, a soothing balm, Lord, bring your soothing balm, bring your healing balm, where the cracks, where the sword marks are, where the spear marks are, where the arrow marks are, Lord, bring healing. And bring transformation. Only you can change a heart, Lord. Bring conviction and transformation. Bring people to repentance so that you can transform them. Thank you. Please be seated. Two minutes. I also want to pray for families. For children. For children and parents. Right? If, 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 if you guys are struggling at home and, and, and there is a clash constantly, the Bible clearly tells us, Parents, once again the Bible tells us, do not provoke your children to anger. And it says, children, honor your parents. Honor your parents so it will go well with you. If you are wondering why your life is not going well with you, young people, perhaps you are not honoring your parents. Honor your parents. Don't diss your parents even though you disagree with him. You can disagree with them, but do not dishonor them. Don't do that. But honor them. And it will go well with you. God will bless you. Parents, maybe we can repent. I believe some of us need to repent for the way we have treated our children. We need to repent for our harshness, for the way we have provoked them to anger. We have not done it right. And if you're a parent this morning and you're like me, do you know you have to come back up once more, one more time? As parents, as someone who's responsible for another, for a child, can we just stand to our feet and say, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Help us be better. Help us to be better at this job. Lord, it's not easy. It's like we're on different planets sometimes, Lord. We can't understand the language they speak. We don't understand how they think sometimes, Lord. Especially this younger generation. Lord, help us. Help us. Help us because we want to be like you to them. And sometimes, Lord, they push buttons that, oh, pretty tough. That we're not here to make excuses. We repent and say, forgive us for where we have failed. Forgive us where we have been bad examples to our children. Forgive us, Lord. We repent this morning. We repent this morning. Forgive us, Lord. Now give us the grace and love. Holy Spirit, would you empower us so we will not keep thinking the way we do and reacting the way we do. But with you, transform us to understand our children and to love them like you do. Help us, I pray. Hallelujah. At the same time, I want to ask children, if, if you want to have a better relationship with your parents, right? if you want to, to honor your parents and you're struggling, it's okay. I know you guys are usually very shy, but can I find at least a few bold people that says, yes, I want to... See, just because you... I'm not going to ask you to stand up, but it doesn't mean that you have a terrible relationship. But would you stand up because you want a 
better relationship. If that is you, children, would you get up? Would you stand up and say, I want a better relationship with my parents? Maybe your parents are not here. That's okay. Maybe your parents don't know the Lord. That's okay. Because the Bible says, honor your father and mother. He didn't say if your father and mother are Christians. He doesn't say that. He says, honor your father and mother for it will go well with you and I will bless you with long, long life. That is a promise. And I pray, Father, this morning for our young people, those who are standing here, Lord. Father, we speak grace, grace over them. We speak grace, grace over them. Lord, even when the world would come against them and push them, would try to force them to dishonoring their parents. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would rise up. Give them new clothes this morning, Lord. All those dead clothes that are trying to be forced on them, we rip them out in the Spirit in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you would put on your robes, your robes, Lord. Clothe them with power that they may prophesy for you, Lord. Clothe them with power that they will see dreams and visions. Bless them, Lord. Bless them according to your word. Lord, help them to understand their parents. Give them understanding. I know if parents can be so hard to understand, but I pray, Holy Spirit, you give them understanding. That we will not be a stumbling block for them. But in that understanding that they would grow and, and, and know how to love you because you are their loving Heavenly Father. Bless them, we pray. Amen. One more thing now. Please be seated. One more thing. One more thing before we go. This is important. You see, like I said, there are, there are many things in our lives that God wants us to strip off. Things that we do, we are indulging in. Things that are so hard. So hard. To take off. Various things. The scriptures go on and on and, and talk about stuff. 1 Corinthians 6 says, The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Galatians 5 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies. It has even things like coarse joking. These things like, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is stuff. Gossip, slander, various things. And I believe if you and I are to be a generation that brings in revival, then there has to be repentance. You and I can't have those dead clothes on. You and I need to take those off. God is saying, I am raising you to be an example to others. I am raising you so that you will be an example to others. I am raising you to be men and women who pray for Sri Lanka to be transformed. I am looking for those Evans and the Noxes today. And if you would be like me, I'm not standing because I'm preaching. I'm standing because I need to deal with stuff. If that is you, would you rise up this, this evening or this morning? Would you rise up where you are and say, Lord, there is stuff I need you to help me with. There is stuff in my life. Young people, you too, you have stuff. But I can't force you to deal with stuff. Do you want to deal with stuff? In the eyes of God, you and I are never rejected. He loves us. And I believe he's given today is an opportunity to deal with stuff because he loves us. Don't wait till you're in the tomb and he has to shout your name out loud for the whole world to hear. But this morning is a moment for us to get our sickness touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we stand. Those of us who are standing, we stand and we repent, Lord. Lord, we don't want to negotiate with you. Lord, I know very often we negotiate. We negotiate areas. We negotiate gray areas. We don't want to negotiate. We want to repent. Because Lord, if there's anything that we will practice that is going to cause someone else to stumble, Lord, we don't want that anymore. 
Not just because you said it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck. But we don't want it because we truly want to be what you're calling us to be. We want to be like Lazarus when he came out from that tomb. Lord, your word says many, many came to see, not Jesus, but they came to see Lazarus. And many, many came to Jesus because of Lazarus. Lord, we want to be like that. When you bring us out of our dead clothes, when you bring us out of our tombs, that many will see our lives and come to you, Jesus. But Lord, today we know with dead clothes on, hiding in a tomb, we will not impact anybody, but we will only drag people into the tomb. We don't want to do that anymore. But Father, we stand here in repentance. Lord, I stand here repenting of my sins. So many of them. We repent as a church. We repent. We repent. We are not going to hide. We repent. And I pray, Father, as we have learned, show us, Lord, certain addictions that we, are, we don't know how to get out of. Lord, show us who we can talk to. Show us how we can break free from these things. That we will not be a slave to the devil anymore. That we will learn to function as sons and daughters. That we will not be brought in. That we will not have idols in our lives. Things that we go to that is not you when we are under fire. That we will not find, as you said, do not be drunk with wine and substances, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you've given us a choice of lifestyle, forgive us when we choose the weak one. Today help us, Holy Spirit, to stay full of the Spirit. No matter what the season, no matter what we're going through, that we will stay full of the Spirit and not look for stuff to overcome the, the trials in our lives. Come Holy Spirit. Transform us. Touch us this morning. Fill us Holy Spirit. And teach us how to stay filled so we don't leak when we leave this place. That the very things you want us to deal with, the various things we read, even the things that are so real, not blatant as adultery or something, Lord, but as, as your word says, rages of anger and stuff that so many of us struggle with, Lord. Lord, we're not going to make excuses. We're not going to make excuses for the people who push us to become angry. But we're coming to you and say, Holy Spirit, transform us to be like Jesus. So we can love our enemies and bless those who curse us. Thank you, Father, for, for, for this message. I know it's not easy, but I thank you for those who respond today. Because you are their Lord. Because you are the Lord of our lives. That's why we respond. We're not just saying it. Today we respond to it. We thank you, Holy Spirit. And pray that you will continue to convict us and show us Show us also how to stay healed and walk in freedom. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Father. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.